All right, we are live. Um, thank you all so much. Um, so far, this conference, Nest Gen, has been amazing. Uh, my name is Jason Sansusi. I am a drone scientist. I am a chief architect at Juniper on Man. I am beside myself with the guests that I have today for this BB Loss, international BB Loss regulation session. We've got some real powerhouses here today. This is going to be really amazing. And I just want to make sure I want to uh, make sure everyone has a chance. If you have comments, questions, you can add them in the comments and questions session, and we will take a look at those um, as we go and afterwards as well. Well, let me get to dive right in, introduce the guests. Uh, let's start um, with John Damish of Iris Automation. Very much appreciate you being here, sir. We also have uh, Pedram Nauruzi, CTO of Velatus Aerospace. And then last, but certainly not least, we have, and actually we have one more as well, so I'll introduce her as well. We have Karin Hollerbach of Aerodyne uh, GmbH. And last but not least, we also have Don Zoldai, CEO of P3 Tech Consulting, and she will be joining us uh, remotely, remotely. You'll understand in a minute. <laughs> well, let's just dive right in because I think this is a really, these are some fantastic questions. I really enjoyed our, our prep session. And I think if we go anything like that, this is going to be amazingly successful for everyone here. So let's start with the very first question. And we're just going to do this conversational style, right? There's no, no pre-scripted. We're just going to do this conversational. I think that's the best way to go. So let's, question number one, what are the key similarities and differences between the regulatory frameworks for BB loss operations in the US, Canada, and Europe. Whoever wants to chime in first. Let's go with John. All right. Thanks very much, Jason. And hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, I, you know, answered my view of that question is um, there's a lot more similarities than there are differences. Uh, when you look at the, the use cases and the operational, uh, or concepts of operation across the world, you know, flying is flying. You're either going to transport good transport goods or people from point A to point B. You're going to observe something from an elevated location. You're going to distribute something like a spray or a fire retardant. But fundamentally, you know, you're taking off, you're flying some mission, and you're going to land. So, so the regulatory environment that surrounds the safety of those operations is going to be quite similar. I think when we look at the integration of uncrewed aerial systems into various national airspaces, the differences really start to pop out in terms of the, the types of traffic and the traffic density. And, and that's, the, that's the stark difference, at least, you know, my expertise is primarily here in the U.S., working with the FAA and, and flying and navigating our national airspace. Um, but when you look at the distribution of low altitude traffic, you know, the U.S. has more than 50 percent of the world's general aviation aircraft traffic. And, you know, 50 percent of that traffic is not equipped with ADSB and frankly spends most of their time flying outside of controlled airspace. So when you look at that as a as a threat vector to low altitude uncrewed aerial operations, you can see why the FAA is going to be the more conservative of the bunch when you look globally around different regulators and what they're trying to do with integrate UAS and the NAS. So I think the differences really lie in the geography and the traffic density. Um, and by that, you know, by that force, you're, you're going to see a different level of conservatism um, across the global regulators. I personally have some experience working with CASA in Australia. Uh, I used to be with a Boeing subsidiary called Institu, and, and we were flying scan eagles beyond visual line of sight in 2016. Um, now, granted, we were flying over Western Queensland, uh, which if anybody knows Western Queensland and Australia, there's not a lot of general aviation traffic out there. So your risk environment is much lower, which means the regulator can be a little bit more forward leaning, take a few more risks and enable different operations to learn in a different way than, than we really can here uh, in most parts of the States. John, thank you so much. Let's, let's, let's switch things up a little bit. Uh, Karin, I would love to get your thoughts on this question. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I basically agree with what John is saying. I do see a lot of similarities at the end of the day. The, the regulatory agencies, their, their job is to keep us all safe. And not only those of us who are, who are engaged in these operations, but particularly also those of us who are not engaged in these operations. So the, you know, the overall objective is to, to keep crewed aircraft safe, anyone who is flying around in the skies, and also keep everyone who may be uninvolved in the operations that we're engaged in on the ground, keep people and property safe. So it's not surprising that there are a lot of similarities when the goals are really the same. And, and as John pointed out, it's flying is flying. 
So the the risk mitigation strategies will be will be fairly different, and certainly as a as an also crewed aircraft pilot, I can I can appreciate those those um, the attention to that to that level of safety. I will say maybe in addition on the similarity side, one of the things and I work both in Europe in that environment as well as in the U.S. environment, and I will say that there's also a you know Europe has has embraced the the UAS industry uh, in in many ways sooner and from and also regulating it sooner and that layers on top of the regulatory framework in some sense being more developed um, and you could argue that that partially makes it more conservative partially makes it less conservative so I'm certainly seeing some differences as well in how how far along are the various scenarios that we're talking about? We can talk about those in a little bit more detail in a bit. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself there. Uh, but also the, the cultural, how does a country or in Europe's case, a set of countries together, how do they come together and how do they view that culturally? So I think there's also some cultural differences in, in terms of what's the relationship to a regulatory framework to begin with as well as what's the relationship to conservatism around safety. So I think that plays into creating some differences as well. Thanks, Karin. Yeah, completely agree. And we're going to get to some of so you, you teed up some great questions for, for just a little bit, but we're going to get there, I promise. Um, for the, the Canadian perspective, eh? Um, let's go. <laughs> I just had to do it. Uh, Pedram, Pedram, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, one thing that, that I've noticed that is very similar amongst all is, you know, safety. Safety has been the number one key priority. Um, and, and one thing that we can notice in all of them is at one point we're trying to mesh with, with the aviation. So the drone industry meshing with the aviation and manned aviation industry. Uh, regulatory wise, you know, all of them are set forth to make sure that everyone's safe flying and making sure that we can mesh within the two, um, uh, basically coexisting with, with manned and unmanned aviation. So the frameworks re revolve around uh, uh, what the aviation industry has done is, I think, something that um, is very important, but also very similar. And each one, I agree with Karen, uh, uh, Karen as well, that they, they're they very um, different in some senses as well, just because of the amount of uh, 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 flights that they have over it, the density of the, of the, of the areas. Um, so in Canada, we can't do too many flights. It's a little bit restricted because of the VV loss reg regulations. Um, so, you know, we do need a lot of tech and void systems and a lot of different things put in place, but, you know, all that is to make sure that the uh, manned aviation and crude aviation is safe. Awesome. Uh, Pedro, thank you. Um, now for an additional take on the U.S. perspective, let's, uh, let's hear from Don Zoldai. Are significantly different. You know, in the United States, I think most people that may be watching this appreciate that we've got part 107. Um, under the 14 United States Code that, that governs that, right? And a key part of that is having visual line of sight. And so beyond visual line of sight right now is happening by virtue of waiver or exemptions and things of this nature. And um, we're kind of behind, honestly, in the United States when it comes to that. Um, you know, the folks that are out there doing VV laws are folks that have got obtained these waivers from the Federal Aviation Administration and primarily doing it in either a very remote area or in an R&D or research and development type context. So that's that's kind of where we are in the regulations. And, you know, Canada has got special uh, operating certificates, I believe. Um, Canada and Europe use um, the SORA, the JARA SORA. Um, that's that's how we're very different, I think, from, from them. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. So that sort of leads to another question that I have for, for this group. Um, and we'll, we'll go in reverse this time. Um, how do these regulatory agencies in the different areas that are responsible for BVL operations, how do they balance the need for innovation and growth in the drone industry that we're talking about here at NestGen with safety and security? Right. How do we do that? So let, let's let's actually start with Dawn. I'd like to hear what she had to say about this. You know, it's it's a tough balancing act uh, that the FAA has to do, and you know, it's it's an unenviable task because you know, everybody wants to move really fast, and of course, they're moving very slow, right? They always talk about 
this crawl, walk, run approach. Um, you know, because when it comes to safety in the national airspace, and by the way, U.S. national airspace is, is probably the safest uh, airspace in the world. Um, you know, they don't want to risk that. And so what you see is a very deliberate approach. You know, what we had was uh, an aviation rulemaking committee that they formed up like two years ago uh, for beyond visual line of sight. They called the BV loss arc uh, about March of last year, 2022. Uh, that group went out and, and produced a 400 plus page report of recommendations. Uh, not all of which were unanimous, by the way, some of which were very controversial, like right-of-way rules, we should modify those to give drones or UAS the right-of-way uh, in certain circumstances. And so, you know, people are very hopeful this year that in 2023, the FAA is going to put out something in terms of policy or regulation. Now, the FAA's Reauthorization Act is coming due this year. And, you know, so the question is, is Congress going to direct something? Uh, is the FAA going to come in the, under the wire before Congress has to do that with some kind of regulation? Um, a lot, you know, a lot of uncertainty here, but the balancing act is real. It's hard. And um, there's so many moving pieces. And, you know, just the fact that the BV loss arc report was 400 pages should tell you how difficult this, uh, you know, this integration will be. Yeah, no, absolutely. Don, thank you. So let's um, let's talk about, let's see, how do I, there we go. Um, let's go to, to Pedram. Let's get the Canadian perspective on this because you're also on the innovation and growth side. And I'm just curious, how, how do you, how do you look at this question? It, it's definitely very challenging, um, specifically working closely with Transport Canada and the Canadian side. It's become a, a really big challenge. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day right now, we're, we're moving forward with special flight operation certificates. I know there is more, the laws are changing and it's changing very rapidly. Um, and it, it does look like we're moving towards the aviation uh, laws regulatory side of things. And it, it only makes sense just because the aviation side has been around for much longer. And unfortunately, as sad as it sounds, it's been written in blood. There's been a lot of different accidents in the aviation side and, and a lot has been learned from there. So we're taking that knowledge and trying to bring it on this side. But then the tech people love to run as fast as they can. You know, we get excited about that. And there's a, there has to be some sort of a balance in between where we can we can do it safely and, and also use the regula regulations and what we've learned in the past 40, 50, 60 years in the aviation world and bring that and join that together. And on our side, it becomes a little bit difficult. Um, and what we find to, to kind of counteract that and make things a little bit easier is putting redundancies in place. So at a lot of the systems that we build, we put a lot of different redundancies, not just one or two. We're talking about three or more redundancies in place. And that's something that has come from the aviation side where they ha do have multiple redundancies. Uh, but again, it, it is a little bit of a challenge trying to uh, basically move at the pace of the aviation world, but also in, in the in the making it innovative. Yeah, no, absolutely agree. Let's, uh, uh, Karin, what are, what are your thoughts since you sort of sit between a few worlds? Sure. Yeah. The, I, I see that same tension. I call it, think of it as a creative tension between, between the need for innovation and the need for, and the need for safety. So hopefully those aren't always inconsistent <laughs> with each other. Hopefully they can come together and move forward, but the, um, but there's certainly a creative tension there. And I see that on, on both the U S as well as on the European side as well. And I think a lot of the, the driver there is certainly industry is, is pushing for, we need to be able to do X, Y, Z, and on the European side, of course, since it's really multiple countries coming together to form regulation that that is then uh, that covers all of the, the European space, that then there are more drivers within that. Some countries may be, they have different airspace, they have different, I mean, density, densities of population, densities of airspace use. Um, they have different approaches, maybe somewhat, and all of those need to be melded together uh, to to continue to evolve that regulatory framework. So I think there are both internal pressures on that side uh, that that may be somewhat different from what we see on the more I'm going to say unified. I don't, I don't mean unified as Don pointed out. It's it's uh, it, even the the report the ARC report was not unanimous in its recommendations. 
um, but I'll say unified from the point of view of there's there's one country there, one um, one umbrella under which it falls. And so I think that is a little bit more challenging to create that single umbrella on the European side. Um, and yet the same basic trends, the same basic dynamics, the push pull of of how do we innovate is is really driven by the need is there. We see the need. The need is growing. The technology to support that need is growing. And then the regulation needs to needs to evolve along with that to enable more and more, even as as things remain safe. Before I before I stop or I'll stop there, but before we move on, maybe to John, I'd like to add one other quick thought, not to derail us. If anyone caught my, I wasn't waving to the crowd earlier. I was I was uh, sort of raising one one additional point on the on the similarities and differences, and that is I know we're talking here about the regulatory frameworks that are driven by so in the in the in the U.S. the FAA so specifically the aviation regulatory frameworks. I would say one thing that also adds one level of difference in in Europe is the GDPR regulations. So. As, Don, as John pointed out earlier, a lot of missions or, or one set of missions is information gathering missions. And so one of the things that I see play into our con ops development, our considerations of what do we do? How do we handle these operations around the missions? Uh, when, particularly when they involve sensor-based missions and they involve data gathering, um, I see that many more of the partners and customers that we interact with um, they immediately also, their minds go to, what are you going to do with the data? So GDPR regulations to handle data privacy and protection. So I just, I don't want to go too far in that direction since, again, the regulatory discussion here is around the aviation regulatory piece. But I just want to raise that as one point that I see also as being somewhat of a difference between the European environment and the U.S. environment. And I'm not entirely sure about the Canadian environment in that regard. So, just want to throw that out there as a as a um, food for thought with regard to differences and similarities. Oh, absolutely, Karen, and that was definitely part of this question. Like, the, it was not just safety, but also security. Data security is a big piece of that. Cybersecurity is a big piece of that. We we heard that in the keynote. That's that is a big piece. So, yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so, sort of with the final thought on this question, John. Yeah, that, thanks, Karen. I think uh, I'm going to say something at the end of my bit here that ties directly into what you just said. And I think, you know, the audience needs to understand um, what is an aviation regulator's job? Their their remit is, is really threefold. Um, they have to mitigate air risk and make, you know, flying in the air as safe as possible for other people in the air. Um, they have to mitigate ground risk basically make it safe for the people that are on the ground, not related to the flight operation, but is happening over their heads. And then they have to provide equitable access to airspace. I mean, that, you know, federal tax dollars pay for our FAA and our airports and our airspace management ATC. So equitable access is important. Um, nowhere in there is there an innovation remit. Uh, and in fact, you know, the agency itself doesn't have resources to go innovate and try things. They look to other uh, organizations like NASA, as an example, to, to do some of the innovation and, and kind of that pioneering work to inform future regulations. So things like the BB Loss Arc, that is the agency reaching out to industry and saying, hey, you guys are the innovators. You know what you want to do. You know what you need to do for your businesses and whatever your use cases are. So, you know, tell us what you need. Um, by no means are we going to get everything we asked for in the report right? Like it's a wish list. Let's be very clear, right? Um, and there's no way the regulator could provide all of those things. But what it does give the regulator is a pointer, right? It's saying, okay, they really care about this. So we don't really have to spend a lot of time over here. Let's really hone our efforts here, iterate on that. I believe what we'll see come out is a series of uh, NPRMs, Notice of Public Rulemakings, that chunk up those recommendations that were in the report and bring things into rule a little bit at a time. Cause that's a much easier lift than trying to bring like, oh my God, all of those recommendations into all of the parts of the regs that you'd have to edit and change. That is a dog's dinner to use a very British cliche. Um, so that's, that's kind of point one for me. Um, point two is you also have to look at the culture of the organizations that are involved in this, in this, you know, environment that we find ourselves in. You know, the regulators of bureaucracy, um, 
there is no reward for taking risk in a bureaucracy. A bureaucracy exists explicitly to minimize and mitigate risk. Whereas us in the startup community and innovators that are bringing new capabilities to market, we race at it, right? Like we don't waste time trying to figure it out and put it on paper. We go build it and see if it works. So, you know, that's a, you know, an inherent clash of cultures, but it's not a bad thing. And I think, um, I think Pedram, you know, called it out right that a focus on safety is the key to progressing innovation in these markets. If we can bring the power of industry and innovation to the safety environment, well, now we've got a common language with the regulator. Now our goals are aligned and we can actually start to do things that get these technologies into the forefront. You know, Don mentioned, um, you know, airspace awareness and traffic detection and detect and avoid. That happens to be what we do. But if you can do that and you can enable a use case that actually removes risk from a human operation today, that's a good thing. Now you've aligned with the FAA's remit. You've aligned with industry's remit. You're making the end user happy because now they have a much more economically viable means to accomplish some task. So, you know, our view is that if you focus on safety, speak the language of the regulator, help them get, you know, what they've been tasked with done, we're in a good place. And then the last thing that I'll say, uh, and this goes back to Karin's comment, FAA stands for Federal Aviation Administration. Um, when I first got my student pilot's license on the back of it was a radio telephone operator's permit. I had to be certified to use the radio. Guess who certifies that? The Federal Communications Commission, right? So when you, know, you think about GDPR, you think about FCC, you think about the Environmental Protection Agency, holy cow, right? We are flying in the airspace. We are not talking about one regulator. We are talking about multiple. So, you know, the regulatory side of things in a large uh, bureaucracy is a very complicated thing. But if we can find the use cases that really provide significant public benefit, then I think that's our entry into service. Like we can now get the public behind this. If you get the public behind this, then you have the political alignment that you need to get the agencies to work together to get to yes. So uh, it's it's a hard world, you know, it's a challenging space. But if anybody's been like, God, why don't they just move faster? This is hard. Um, it, it definitely takes time, but the public has to get on board. And if the public gets on board, I think we have shown that, guess what? We can do things pretty quickly. So uh, over to you. Yeah, no, John, awesome. Um, and you literally teed up the next question because it was your question during our conversation. We're like, yes, I want everyone's thought on this. So you mentioned that clash of cultures. You've already answered this. So we're going to go to the other other panelists. So there's a clash between the agile technology companies and the comparatively slow bureaucracies um, that are involved here. It's a prevalent issue. How do we bridge that gap? So let's go to um, Karin. Let's go to Karin. I'm curious what your thoughts are on here. Sure. I very much experienced that gap. And I actually see it as not just a technology, regulatory, I, I really see it split into three. And that is on the regulatory side, the technology side, and what I'll call the, the aviation operation side, right? So we have, as we are developing our con ops and making them a reality, that more and more is technology reliant. And the technology players themselves may or may not also be the the operators of this technology. They may or may not be actually flying and implementing those missions. They may also be uh, bringing together multiple pieces of technology to make, those, to make those use cases work. And I actually see that all three of those are slightly different in, or significantly in some cases different in, in their approaches to, to innovation, agility, how they think about safety, all of these aspects that we're talking about here. So when I think of the three-way uh, split there or the three perspectives, I think definitely of the of the two that John highlighted and the additional nuance in separating out the technology from, uh, I'll just call it the operators. It's maybe a little bit simplistic to use, just use that language here, is that there too is a uh, maybe on the on the pure technology side, I'm seeing companies come into the space and working with companies in the space 
that are their roots are entirely on the technology side, maybe even entirely on the I'm an agile technology startup side. And that's fantastic. And I love that. And the the engineer in me makes me that makes me very happy. The even that aspect of it sometimes is is different in mindset from the technology or from the operator side. So not all of us clearly, but a number of us are have backgrounds in both crude aviation as well as uncrewed aviation. And even there, I think when we bring that background, we bring some of that tradition of these are the structures that that have enabled our use of the airspace to be largely safe. Uh, these are the disciplines around that. These are the ways in which we behave and that this is how we think about missions. This is how we think about applying technologies. These are our personal comfort levels, I'll call it, whether it's personal at the individual level or at the company level. And that is, in some sense, kind of a blend of this agile, want more, want innovation and safety in the crewed aircraft world. Safety for me is extremely personal, right? (laughs) I'm the one up there in that aircraft. I want to make sure that I make it back home alive, as long in addition to all my passengers, in addition to everyone else around me. But it really becomes extremely extremely personal very quickly. And I'm used to, in the crewed aircraft world, operating in this somewhat more structured environment. Whereas if I'm out flying uh, an uncrewed aircraft, then, especially if it's on, a, on, on the smaller size, then my mindset can be very different. And if that's all I have, then my mindset can be more of one in which well, I can go out and maybe not quite do anything I want, but I have a lot more freedom and I'm used to that freedom. And so when when we bring in the agile technology startup kind of a mindset of go, 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 constant changing, constant um, innovation, constant, um, constant freedom to create something, then that also is a little bit different from the operator mindset of, uh, well, where's the structure to make this all happen? So I see it as a little bit more of a, of a triangulated creative tension in, in making that happen. I like that. No, that totally makes sense. Adding the operations portion of that is is a big deal. Even if we're talking about drone in a box technology, there's still the operations aspect as we develop these con ops. So that's a, a great observation. It's definitely a triangle. <laughs> Um, yeah, let me give you a quick example, if I may. Sure. There's, and I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm gonna use a, a, an example which just makes me, makes me chuckle, and, and it's a very small example. I'm not naming any names because I'm not here to shame anyone or any or anything, um, but it's just an example that stuck with me from a from a few years ago. Um, I was putting together a a technology system uh, for a particular sensor mission. And uh, we were using one, one UAS model and one we're evaluating some of the payload to put onto that. So I'm going to speak in general terms again, because I, this, the, the point of this is not to, not to highlight any, any one manufacturer. And I was in, engaging with, with the, one of the payload manufacturers around, okay, you, 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 your claims are that this was developed for this particular drone model what can you tell me about what this does to the CG, for example? And the question came back, what's a CG? And I thought, oh, okay. All right, let me reset my expectations of this conversation. And I thought, well, okay, this is the, this is the customer support person I'm talking to. Why should this individual know? So I explained CG is the center of gravity. And here's, you know, here's why we care from an aviation perspective. Okay, let me go talk to engineering and find out. Great. We're on a roll here. Then, then the answer came back. Well, okay, got it, and that's proprietary information. And I thought, oh, actually, I could just go out and put in together and measure this, right? I mean, there's nothing proprietary about this. I'm simply asking whether this is something that you could give me a your official answer and b it'll save me the trouble of having to go measure this. There's absolutely nothing proprietary here. And so the whole conversation stuck with me because it was a, an example of here's a company from a tech space, functionally, you know, great what they had worked well, 
but the mindset of why do we even care about this kind of a thing? Why, why would this customer be asking me these questions? There was a significant gap there, right? It, it was purely a mindset of we have, we have a product that we put out on the market as soon as we decided that it worked with, without an understanding of what's the environment in which this, this product has to operate. And yes, that was, that's one anecdote, but it kind of stuck with me because in some sense, I see that repeated in different forms. Um, and I think this is part of the gap of, of how do we innovate and, and how do we make that fit within this safety oriented, regular, regulated environment? Back over to you, Jason. I'm I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up. So so Pedro, let's get your let's get your thoughts on this. You know, with or without any culture gap shaming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know, it's it's really tough. Um, I I feel like the 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 people who sit closer to both sides, which would be the operator and the regulator, would really be the manufacturer that sits in the center. Um, they that's, that's my point of view is that we are the closest. We have to abide by the regulation, but we also have to create a system an environment that would work for the operator as well. And that becomes really, really difficult. You have to think about multiple different things, multiple, think about the, the operator's aspect, the operation aspect, the usability, the user friendliness, and, and then think about the other side, the safety aspect of it from the regulatory side, which is redundancies, making sure everything is safe, you know, operating in a safe uh, flight envelope and, and, and operating the entire system in a safe way. So as a manufacturer, we can put a lot of things in place to help that and aid that, both aid the, the regulatory side and to make them happy, but also on the operation side. So it makes it really important. I find it really important as an organization to be very versatile and have talent in your team that know both and can both chime in. Um, something that we've done with with one of our technologies is that we we work really close with Transport Canada, but at the same time we have a regulatory guy in house. I'm not the master with regulatory. I'm I'm a I'm a technology geek. Let's call that. So at the end of the day, for me, it's I want to rush to the fastest technology, but then I have someone in the organization that says, "Hey, hold your horses. That's not going to work." Let's think about the safety aspect of it, a regulatory aspect of it, and then we have the operation team that come in put some forces on me on the other end saying, hey, can it work in extreme conditions? Can it work in this kind of environment that people are going to be using that technology for? So I feel like as a manufacturer, we have the responsibility to sit in the middle and, and listen to both sides and implement both of them to make sure that the system is safe from the regulatory side, but at the same time, from an operational side, it makes sense as well. Absolutely. And um, just to, to wrap up this question, because we have we'll only have one more. I'm a little sad. We're almost done. Um, let's hear let's hear from Dawn. And this is actually Dawn's question for, you know, Jason, my my thought here is that the technology companies that are partnering up with aviation, that they're doing so with eyes wide open. In other words, they're going into this appreciating that there is a safety culture here, that this will be a crawl, walk, run approach. Uh, you know, that maybe at least in the U.S. we're in kind of in that crawl to walk stage. Um, you know, they need to be in it for the long haul. And so my assumption is a lot of these folks already know that. Um, you know, now what we're seeing are really rich partnerships, though, right? Because you know, I, th I think even on the on the hardware side and the drone side, people are realizing, you know, we're all better together and you cannot do this alone. And so I think as trends go, we're seeing those gaps being bridged and partnerships really coming to fruition, especially over the past year. Um, you know, and I think we're going to keep seeing more and more of that. But the reality is the regulatory side of this is going to remain slow um, and you know, the companies that are going to survive are the ones that are planning for that. Awesome. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, so the last question that we have is looking to the future. So what are the emerging trends of regulations in BV loss in the three areas, U.S., Canada, and Europe, and, you know, that will impact the future of this industry? Let's start with uh, start with Pedro for the Canadian perspective. Yeah, so I think um, something that that's becoming very apparent is the technology aspect. Um, detect and avoid systems, uh, making sure there's redundancies. Um, those are something that's becoming very, very uh, common and and, and being um, accepted. Um, 
at, at the end of the day, one thing that we have to do is we have to understand that we are living in an aviation world. Uh, we have to abide by those regulatory standards. Um, so that that's really what it really comes down to, is making sure that we can take those ad, 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 uh, standards uh, and, and understand them very well and implement the, the technology to that and not work the other way around. A lot of uh, companies tend to create a technology and then chase the standards after. Uh, but realistically, as a base, what we need to understand is that the aviation standard comes first. Uh, regulatory comes first, and we build to that rather than working the other way around. All right, John, what are your thoughts on this? We have a few minutes left, so. Yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, future trends, I think we're going to see an increasing amount of BV loss approvals that that largely track to um, some of the key ARC recommendations. I mean, we're already seeing approvals granted with the concept of shielding. Um, and for those of you that don't, haven't heard that, it's basically the uh, – the assumption that says, okay, well, if I'm underneath the top of a radio tower with my drone and I'm within X amount of feet of that tower, there probably shouldn't be a crewed aircraft there because they're going to crash into the tower. So, you know, we are, we are seeing some rational kind of thinking and okay, yeah, that makes sense. And we're seeing approvals with like a 50 foot um, bubble around uh, a structure as you don't need a DAA, you don't need a special permission, you don't need a waiver. Here you go. Here's your approval. You can go do that. We expect to see shielding mature and perhaps even become part of rule. Um, I think, you know, Karen put it very well. Uh, we can't forget about the operator and the operations. Um, and when you look at part 107, in a lot of ways, it kind of skips over a whole bunch of stuff around those things by, by putting a bubble of limitations around, around the operation and the operator. Um, I don't think we're going to see many gross changes to part 107. I think we will see a new part of the regs that talks about operating rules in the U.S. for beyond visual line of sight. But I think that is going to point to other existing parts of the regs because guess what, you know, We've been around 100 years. We've been flying a lot. Like, we know a lot. The regs that are there are there for a reason. And, and Pedram put it well. Unfortunately, a lot of them have been written in blood. So they're not wrong. And and they, they do apply to a lot of aspects of this uncrewed world. It's just they need to be tweaked a little bit, right? So uh, I think the future of the regulatory environment is going to look more like that than some giant sweeping change that all of a sudden makes all the BV loss stuff happen. Um it's not, you, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be bite-sized pieces for specific use cases. And I'll tie it back to my earlier question where there's a significant public benefit or economic benefit, right? Like those are the ones that are going to be said, okay, first and under very controlled circumstances to ensure we're not eroding safety of the nest. All right, Karin, 60 seconds. Awesome. <laughs> first thing I'm going to say very briefly on the previous question, loved Don's emphasis on partnering and partnerships and how, this is becoming more, I'll say it's even part of the trend. This is becoming more and more something where multiple parties, multiple organizations come together to produce something. So love, absolutely love that comment from Don. The only other thing that I would add briefly to what Pedram and John said, totally agree on those, on those comments regarding technology and maybe even build from a European perspective on John's comments around uh, one of the things I'm already seeing is that there are predefined scenarios, predefined things uh, where as long as you are within the confines of this type of an operation, it makes it substantially easier for you to get the the approvals that you may be that you may be looking for. So I'll just leave it at that. But I definitely see that as a as a trend happening in Europe right now. So we and we have one more person to hear from. Let's let's hear from from Dawn on this last question. Folks like the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, you know, the great stuff they're doing out in North Dakota, you know, Advantis and New Air, and the list goes on and on, right? So that's going to keep happening. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more, you know, kind of ship to shore, maybe, you know, middle mile deliveries happening beyond visual line of sight in the energy sector. Um, I think we're going to see some larger vehicles getting approvals. I also think we're going to see, of course, public safety, that tactical BV loss approval they got under Part 91. Um, we're going to see a lot more of that happening. Hopefully drones first responder really blossoming this year. And then, of course, drone delivery, um, you know, is that going to be beyond visual on site? I don't think so. I d that's not been a trend, and I don't think it's going to happen. I think what you're going to see with the smaller drones is going to be more so, uh, you know, long line linear inspections in more remote places. 
Um, so I, I think those have been the trends. I think those trends are going to continue. And until the regulatory front changes, um, you know, that's what we're going to see, at least here in the U.S., Yeah, no, absolutely. And and we're actually at the end, man. This has been chock full of all types of information. I apologize we went right to the end. But thank you to all of the panelists very, very much. And thank you to the title sponsor, DJI Enterprise, and platinum sponsor, Velocity Aerospace, for allowing us to be here today. Uh, thank you all so much. And we'll see you in the next panel.